Hi, good evening, and uh, welcome to the Epilepsy Foundation of Connecticut Ask the Expert series, um, where each month we feature a topic related to epilepsy. And tonight, uh, we're going to be talking about rescue medications and seizure action plans. My name is Monica Anzalone, and I'm the Director of Programs and Services at the Epilepsy Foundation, and I'll be moderating, moderating our presentation tonight. <clears throat> uh, I know many of you um, may be familiar with what we do at the Epilepsy Foundation, but just in case you are unaware, we are an affiliate office that is located in Connecticut, and our mission is to support people that are impacted by epilepsy, family members, uh, individuals, that have this diagnosis and that we try and do through advocacy, education, programs and connections to ensure that people can live their best lives. So um, before I introduce our speaker for tonight, um, we just wanted to um, share a few things with you all. Um, if you have questions, we want to hear them, but please just type them in the chat. Um, section um, on the bottom of your screen, I believe that should be, and we will uh, take care of those at the end of the presentation. Um, <clears throat> for If for any reason um, you uh, are, are unable to um, hear or there's some technological issues, go ahead and type that in the chat, and I, that's part of why I'm here, to help with those sorts of things. Um, also, um, in typing questions, just keep in mind that we're happy to answer questions, of course, uh, concerning tonight's topic, but um, please don't ask personal questions um, or ask for med uh, medical recommendations. We want to make sure that your doctor takes care of those sorts of things, but feel free to ask any general questions related to our topic tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Lila Warden. Um, she is a pediatric epileptologist and neurologist at the Connecticut Children's um, Dr. Warden's areas of interest include epilepsy, the ketogenic diet, and also other dietary therapies for epilepsy and also for neonatal uh, seizures as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I am going to hand this over to Dr. Warden. And Thank she you. is going to get us into the material tonight. Thank you, Dr. Warden. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining. And uh, Monica, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here tonight. I'm talking on a topic that is probably familiar to many of you, but hopefully you will learn something new. People come to these talks often because they have a loved one or a family member who has a seizure disorder or who has had a seizure in the past. And so some of the questions we hope to answer today are what are some of those options for seizure rescue medications? What are seizure action plans? And, you know, do we need one? Do we need one of each? And the answer is not necessarily. So we'll talk about that tonight. And as Monica said, I am happy to answer any questions. These Ask the Expert series are often briefer. We'd, I'll be talking for about half an hour. And then after that, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. So disclosures for the talk today include the fact that I will be talking about some non-FDA approved seizure rescue medications. As a pediatric epileptologist and a pediatric neurologist in general, I, I know that many of our medications that we use in children are actually off-label because they're just not tested in that age group. So some of these medication options that I'll be talking about for seizure rescue medicines are not things that are FDA approved for safety, but however are used by other people in the field. The topics that we'll be touching on tonight is first of all, what is a seizure emergency? What constitutes a seizure emergency for me? And is that different for you? We will then be talking about some of the FDA approved home rescue medications for seizure emergencies. And then I'll also touch upon some alternative seizure rescue medications, including ones that are in the pipeline in clinical trials and ones that have um, may come out soon. And then additionally, we'll talk about seizure action plans and go through what are the parts of a seizure action plan and when should we be considering one? So first of all, what constitutes a seizure emergency? As I started with, I'm sure many of you here 
are here because you have a loved one who has a seizure disorder or who has had seizures in the past. And I want you to think about that person for a minute and think about what would you consider a seizure emergency for them? Not only, you know, any seizure, of course, feels very scary to watch and witness. And even as a neurologist, I've seen many, many seizures and they still feel scary to me too. Um, but what constitutes an emergency is not the same for each person. What many people think of is something that we call status epilepticus. Status epilepticus is defined by one of two things. The first is a generalized convulsive seizure. So whole body stiffening and shaking that is continuous for more than five minutes. But the second definition is two or more seizures without return to baseline in between. Status epilepticus um, is one of our seizure emergencies that, that everyone agrees upon. And how common is it? Well, it's not very common. So if you have epilepsy, chances that you will have status epilepticus are not very likely. When we think about the statistical measure of how often something happens, we think about it in how many people per year. And status epilepticus occurs in approximately somewhere between 10 and 40 occurrences per 100,000 people per year. It's hard to grasp what that means, but I can tell you it doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. However, it is something that is scary, not just to witness, but also has real repercussions and um, is can be life-threatening. So in adults, the mortality of status epilepticus ranges between 10 and 20% uh, by the time you are discharged from the hospital. In children, that number is a little bit less. So uh, children have status of mortality associated with status epilepticus between three and 10%. So it's certainly less than children. Nonetheless, it's nothing that anyone wants to experience. Mm -hmm. There has been a shift over time. Um, just under 10 years ago, there was really a shift in the definition of status epilepticus. It used to be that a seizure lasting for 30 minutes would be considered status epilepticus, but less than that, you wouldn't use the term. And that has shifted over time to say, you know what, status epilepticus, the point where we think this is a seizure emergency, should really only be five minutes. Why is that? Well, they realize that most seizures last under five minutes, and that after five minutes, seizures have a hard time on stopping by themselves. They have this predisposition to go through this positive feedback loop where it's just feeding the fires and it's hard to put that fire out by itself. And we also know that earlier treatment with our seizure rescue medicines are the most effective way of stopping this. And if you give a seizure rescue medicine, the same medicine, 20 minutes into a seizure versus five minutes into a seizure, it's much more effective at that five minute mark than 20 minute mark. So over time, people have realized that treating seizures earlier is uh, not only leads to better treatment success, but it is important. And so there has been a shift over time in convulsive status epilepticus. That's where you have that whole body stiffening and shaking. What about people who don't shake with their seizures? Well, there's something called non-convulsive status epilepticus. This is defined by seizure activity seen on an EEG, an electroencephalogram where they put the wires on your head, but there's no clinical or outward findings associated with convulsive status epilepticus. And there's kind of two types of non-convulsive status epilepticus that we see. The first is somebody who is what we call wandering confused. So a, it often starts after somebody has a witness generalized tonic-clonic seizure, so the whole body convulsive seizures, and they wake up and they are not uh, they're not with it, you know, they're not waking up appropriately or they're waking up and they have persistent confusion for hours afterwards. They're disoriented, 
but they're awake, maybe not talking correctly. Maybe they don't know what season it is. Maybe they're very slow to answer simple questions like their name. Um, they likely have ongoing seizure activity inside of their head that we're not seeing on the outside. Sometimes we see this in, in certain types of generalized epilepsy syndromes called atypical absence seizures, where it doesn't necessarily follow a whole body convulsive seizure, but it can present like that from the get-go. So these prolonged periods of being confused and disoriented. Um, the second presentation of non-convulsive status epilepticus is an acutely ill patient. So these are ICU level sick patients. And for whatever reason, they end up in the ICU as part of that stressor to their body, they have higher rates of having seizures. And because they are um, either comatose or very, um, uh, very un unconscious to some degree, um, they often don't have signs on the outside of having a seizure. Occasionally, there can be some subtle twitching of the face or the eyes, or sometimes the eyes twitching or jerking to the side. That could be a sign of non-convulsive status epilepticus, but most of the time, because these patients have breathing tubes and are on many medications to help keep them sedated, they don't move. The Prognosis overall for non-convulsive status epilepticus is worse in terms of associated mortality and morbidities. Um, in particular, however, it is worse for these patients, for these patients who are presenting with non-convulsive status epilepticus because they are very sick and in the ICU. That first category of wandering confused category, so patients who uh, are awake and walking around but disoriented, um, those patients usually do well. In non-convulsive status epilepticus, there actually is not an agreed upon time frame where people say, okay, this is when we treat, this is when we intervene with medications. And it's a little bit unclear how long do we let that go before we say, okay, that's too long and we should intervene with a, a medication to stop it or not. And there's research that's ongoing right now in the critical care field. We know that people who have seizures when they are in the ICUs have worse outcome, but it's not clear if that's a cause from the seizure or it's a cause from being sick itself. And so people are, are studying this now to say, how much seizure do we tolerate? Um, and when do the risks of giving the seizure rescue medicines outweigh the benefits or vice versa? Oftentimes longer, certainly longer than 30 minutes in an hour, people will treat and certainly in under 10 minutes, not necessarily, but it depends on um, what's going on clinically with that patient as well. So to go back to our original question, what constitutes a seizure emergency? Well, the answer is it really depends on what type of seizure you have. For one example, you may have a teenager who has a type of epilepsy called juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and they've had only one lifetime generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Those are those whole body stiffening and shaking seizures. And for this person, maybe a seizure emergency is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure only if it lasts longer than five minutes. This patient has only ever had one and maybe it stopped on its own within 90 seconds, which is a typical time frame. For this patient, you would want to wait longer to, to give the seizure rescue medicine because you're thinking the risk of them needing it and the risk of them going into status epilepticus is relatively low. The second patient is a toddler, maybe a two or three-year-old who has a type of intractable or drug-resistant epilepsy called Dravet syndrome. These patients often have very frequent seizures that are heat or fever induced, and they go on to have very prolonged seizures, often requiring rescue medicines frequently. Now, in this example, this patient does have a history of recurrent hospitalizations for status epilepticus. And thinking back to the prior slide, giving that seizure rescue medication earlier is the most effective. So since we know that this child has repeated episodes of needing to go to the hospital to stop seizures, we want to give it almost right away. And that would be a different definition of a seizure emergency for this patient than with the first. 
So why, before we move on, I just wanted to mention, why is it that we intervene at five minutes? I um, mentioned on the previous slide that that's the point where seizures have a hard time stopping on their own. One important point to take away is it's not the point where people get brain injury permanently from having a seizure. And I'd like to mention that because the point where people get brain injury is probably much longer than you'd think. It is unclear in humans when that point is because it's all the research has been done with animal studies and in animals like mice or rats that that point is probably 30 or 60 minutes or even longer. So you have to be seizing for a very long time to get permanent brain injury because of the seizure. So who needs a rescue medicine at all? So if you have Status epilepticus, of course, we're trying to uh, prevent or treat. And then seizure clusters, the other indication for a rescue medication. Seizure clusters are also sometimes referred to as acute repetitive seizures. And there is a standardized definition. And that definition out there was made because that is what the FDA and, oops, let me go back. I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, there we go. Um, so seizure clusters do have a standardized definition that is put out there by the FDA and also these pharmaceutical companies. They need to make a definition to say, well, how is this medicine working to, to treat uh, seizure clusters? And they define these clusters as three or more self-terminating seizures in 24 hours. So those are the two indications for rescue medicine. So status epilepticus or seizure clusters. What we're trying to do is figure out who's going to have that before you actually have status epilepticus or seizure clusters. So we think about who is at high risk for seizure, seizure emergencies. Anybody who has refractory or intractable epilepsy, the other term for that is drug-resistant epilepsy, they all mean the same thing. It means that you have tried two different seizure medications that were appropriately chosen for your seizure type at good doses, so at medium or high doses, and you continue to have seizures. We use that cutoff because after two different seizure medicines, the likelihood that a third or another seizure medicine after that is going to make you completely seizure-free, uh, that's the point where it goes quite low, under 5%. We also know that you're at high risk for a seizure emergency if you have had status epilepticus in the past. If you had epilepsy start when you were quite young, we're talking about infants or toddlers. If you have a high frequency of seizures, or uh, if you are a far distance to something like an EMS or a hospital. So if you live way out in a rural area and it takes EMS, once you call EMS, it takes them 20 minutes to get there because maybe it's a volunteer firefighter or volunteer EMS service, and then it's another 30 minutes to a hospital, that might be a point where you would say, you know what, I would, I would like a seizure rescue medication at home to be able to do something. So what are the seizure rescue medications? The seizure rescue medications all belong to a class of medication called benzodiazepines. And benzodiazepines all have similar side effects. They will cause sleepiness or sedation. They'll cause balance problems. So somebody gets up and they kind of seem a little bit drunk and walking crooked. They can cause respiratory depression, so slowness of breathing or shallowness of breathing. Sometimes that can lead to oxygen problems as well, so they don't come without risks. And then also low blood pressure. Low blood pressure being seen more often in um, people who are older, very older, very young. Um, when we make a choice of a seizure rescue medicine, the things that I am considering as a physician is uh, wondering, okay, how long does this medication take to be absorbed into the body? And different routes of administration can lead to faster absorption or slower absorption. How long does it last in your body? Is this a medicine that's quick in and quick out? Or is it gonna be helpful for preventing somebody who has seizure clusters in the same day? I want a medicine that lasts a long time if I'm trying to prevent a seizure 12 hours later. And then third, importantly, perhaps, is it affordable? So some of these seizure rescue medications are brand name only. And what are some of the options uh, for people who are asked to pay out of pocket for that? 
So let's run through some of the FDA approved seizure rescue medications. The first uh, that is most commonly used in pediatric patients is called rectal diazepam. It is often referred to as the brand name diastat. However, it is also available in a generic form. This is FDA approved for ages two and up. And it's dosed based on a child's weight um, in 2.5 milligram increments. And the pro of this is that it's one of the few seizure medications, um, seizure rescue medications that can be used in a young age group. The con, of course, is the main one that everyone thinks about. Rectal administration can be difficult. If you have a toddler, Maybe not so difficult, but if you end up with an 11 year old, you know, a 12 year old, a 20 year old, um, rectal administration can be quite difficult. Do people mind rectal administration? Well, people are giving the diastat or the rectal diazepam when they're actively having a convulsive seizure. And during this time, there's loss of consciousness. So the person is not going to remember having received it. However, it doesn't mean that they won't be embarrassed for their surroundings later on if they're an older child. The good news is now there are alternatives. So there's something called intranasal diazepam, which only comes in a brand name formulation called Valtoco. And Valtoco is dosed based upon the weight in kids. It's also dosed on um, three different doses in adults based upon your weight as a small, medium, or large adult. And each spray of the device, or excuse me, each device has one spray. And I have a training device here actually. It is, let's see if I can get on camera. So this device has the medication in a canister underneath and you hold it with your thumb on the bottom and push it as far as you can up somebody's nose all the way against their nostrils and do one hard push. Now, each time you push, it's not reusable. Each time you push, that's one spray and that spray can come in different doses. The um, confusing thing about Valtoco is particularly when you get to adult size dosing, so 15 milligrams or 20 milligrams, that's actually two devices to give you that amount. So one device in one nostril and then a second device in the other nostril, that equals one rescue medication dose for that person. Um, as I mentioned, they are brand name only. The Tofoco was approved in 2020, uh, which means that after, I think we said seven years, Monica, the, um, the uh, medication will come off patent. And so it may be cheaper in the future. Diazepam also comes in a third formulation that most people don't know about because it did only recently just get approved. It is a buccal film called Liebervent. Buccal is the medical term for cheek administration. So it is a dissolvable film, just like a cool mint Listerine films that people used to have for, for um making their breath minty. And it is, of course, brand name only because it just got approved and is approved for treatment of re acute repetitive seizure. So again, that word for seizure clusters. And then it was tested actually only in younger children. So it was tested in that two to five-year-old age group. While we can give diastat, which is rectal diazepam at that age, it is still unwieldy and most people don't wanna give their child a rectal medication when they are actively seizing. This again is brand name only and just came out. Um, most of these are available for pharmacies to order. It's just something that people don't use very often because there are other alternatives. Now, another alternative is the nas is called nasolam, and I apologize, I didn't put the um, name of the generic on here. It's called intranasal midazolam. So midazolam is a cousin medicine of diazepam. It actually only is brand name, and so nasolam is the brand name. This uh, was approved slightly earlier in 2019, and so in 2027, it should come off of patent. Um, nasolam, importantly, was a, in, approved in an older age group. So nasolam is only approved in ages 12 and up versus Valtoco, which is approved in ages six and up. 
Nasalinum um, is easier in some respects in that it is one device and there's only one dose. So there's not multiple doses. And once you give that dose, you can give a second dose, just like any seizure rescue medication. You can give a second dose if somebody is seizing, and that was talked about with your provider, if they are not responding to the first dose. Um, now you are not fooled. This device is the same device I held up for Valtoco and for Nasalam, both of the intranasal rescues. Um, why is that? Is because they look exactly the same. One just says Valtoco and the other says Nasalam. The plastic applicator device is the part that is brand name. So that is the technology that allows us to take a liquid medication from the bottom and have it aerosolize um, into a spray when we push really hard. It is um, notably a uh, administration device that does look like a few other intranasal medications. So I like to tell families about this so they don't get uh, concerned or surprised. So there is a medication many people have heard of called Narcan, which helps to re reverse opioid or fentanyl um, overdoses. Narcan has the same plastic administration device. In addition, there's an intranasal migraine medication called Sumatriptan that also comes in the same plastic administration device. So the device itself has been used for other purposes, but it's much more convenient than giving somebody a rectal gel. So it's very popular to switch people to that, particularly if they're above the FDA approved ages of six or up for Valtoco. So let's move on now to talk about some of the alternatives. And again, these are not FDA approved. Now there are no approved uh, FDA approved seizure rescue medications in children under two. Um, as a pediatric epileptologist, I do see infants and uh, young toddlers, one-year-olds and infants who have epilepsy and who need a seizure rescue medicine. So we do use things off label sometimes, such as using diastat in smaller age groups. Um, there there all are other, there are alternatives, however. So midazolam in particular uh, is often compounded to a nasal spray. What does it mean to be a compounded medicine? Well, that means you take a pill or a tablet form of a medication and it goes to a special pharmacy that actually crushes it and dissolves it and puts it into a suspension or a different formula. So, so you have it in a different way than the pill was actually made. Um, so we can compound midazolam into a nasal spray so it's more dilute than what's commercially available. So one spray gives you a smaller milligram amount of midazolam. There are also dissolvable tablets in that benzodiazepine class that we'll talk about that can be used, or there's a buccal administration, so cheek administration of a liquid medication is often used as well, more often in Europe, but we can use it here too. So these are just some alternatives that I'll touch upon a little bit to, to think about when, um, for example, the out-of-pocket cost for you for something like the commercially available rescue medicine is prohibitive. So this is what compounded midazolam spray looks like. Um, there are a few compounding pharmacies around the state of Connecticut, not your regular CVS or Walgreens. There are some special ones, um, but the your doctor would know which pharmacies have the ability to compound medications and they can put the medication inside the vial, again, in a smaller concentration than what's typical. And then this is a similar atomizer a device where you take the top off, put it all the way up the nose as close as you can, and then do one push and it'll make a spray with a certain amount come out the top. The one on the right side is actually what we used to do before the commercially available one came out. And this um, is a syringe that has a device on top called an atomizer. And the syringe actually has the IV formula of midazolam. So the IV versions of medications are often more concentrated than what you would get, for example, in a liquid suspension. 
and um, you would be sent home with an IV bottle, so a small bottle, and needles, which are, of course, uh, something you don't want to have around unless you need to. And then when you needed it, you would draw it up, take the needle top off, and then put the atomizer on. And then it makes that um, IV midazolam solution into a nasal spray. We still use this occasionally. And these are ways to potentially get intranasal midazolam for a younger patient or a patient for whom insurance is not covering the more expensive brand name ones. Again, the medications themselves, diazepam, midazolam, those are old medications, but the devices are the more expensive parts. I mentioned that there are tablets as well that can dissolve. So another cousin medication called clonazepam comes in orally disintegrating tablets. They are very small tablets and very easily fall apart. They just crumble very easily. And they come in multiple size formulations. Um, and we can use the smallest dose in infants even. They get either placed under the tongue or if somebody is actively seizing, they often clutch down their jaw. So we usually recommend placing it between the gum and the cheek on either the upper or the lower level, and it disintegrates within a minute or so. Um, these are often not expensive, but for some people they can be for some reason. Um, it, they are frequently less expensive, however, if the insurance is not covering something like the nasal spray. The good part about this is they last a long time in your body. They have what's called a long half-life, meaning that it takes a long time to go out of your body completely. So if you are somebody who is having, when you have a seizure, you don't just have one, but you have multiple in a day, this might be something where after the first seizure, your doctor might recommend taking a medication like clonazepam to try to prevent more throughout the day. And then lastly, I mentioned that there are some uh, liquid medications that can be given in the cheek, again, in the cheek pocket to stop a seizure. And in Europe in particular, in other international places, they use something called buckle uh, or again, cheek administration of midazolam. Um, in Europe, they have a specifically approved uh, cheek administration formula, and it is one of the most common rescue medications used outside of the hospital in Europe. Um, you can also just use the IV concentrated version of midazolam, draw it up and give it in the cheek pocket. Now it doesn't absorb as quickly as if you give it in the nose, but it is better than nothing if you don't have um, anything else at that time and you're waiting for EMS. There are a few clinical trials out there. Actually, I apologize. There's only one that I could find that was active. So not a few, just one. Uh, there's one called uh, alprazolam and there's an inhaler device. Um, alprazolam is the generic name for Xanax, which is an anti-anxiety medicine, but is another type of benzodiazepine. And they uh, made an inhaler device called the staccato system. And if you're interested in clinical trials or trying this out, there is a link here at clinicaltrials.gov. It gives you all of the up-to-date um, NIH-funded research trials that are recruiting. It's not around our area, but alprazolam is currently being looked at as an alternative medication and in an alternative administration route. So lastly, I'm just going to touch upon seizure action plans. So what are seizure action plans? Seizure action plans are a document to let people around you know a few important things. So what type of seizures a patient has, what constitutes a seizure emergency for that patient, and then thirdly, what to do in the case of a seizure emergency. Because again, your emergency may not be my emergency. How do you make a seizure action plan? Well, this is from the epilepsy.com website that if you go to um, this group's website, epilepsyct.com, you can connect there as well. They offer seizure action plans in many languages that you can see here, not just Spanish and Chinese, also Tagalog and Vietnamese. Um, and so it is a place where you can get started if you don't already have one and you were asked to provide one or you want to think about what would constitute a seizure emergency for me? So seizure action plans come in a few different flavors, but this is the one from this Epilepsy Foundation. And we're gonna walk through a few different parts of it. This is the first page of it. 
The first section, again, is seizure information. So here is where you would document what are your types of seizures, how long do they last, how often do they occur, and what does it look like? Here's an example of what it might look like. The seizure type might be called a focal clonic seizure, clonic being the term, the medical term for rhythmic jerks. And in general, you have these that last two minutes and they occur monthly. And what happens? Well, you have right face and arm jerks during this. The next section of the seizure action plan tells somebody, how do I respond to a seizure? And there's a few different parts that are buried in here. So um, importantly, what this seizure action plan gives you the option to check off things or not check off things. And I mentioned that because um, some of the, the default that some people might think of when somebody has a seizure, oh, call 911 and go to the hospital. Um, when somebody has a seizure disorder where they have seizures that are hard to treat and they have seizures frequently, for them, that's not always the case. You know, you don't always have to call 911 and go to the hospital. So making sure people around you know how to respond is important. But what should always be checked off is seizure first aid. You know, stay by their side, make sure they're safe, put them on their side. And then if they have a rescue medication, giving that. You can have a seizure action plan without having any seizure rescue medication. Some people just have on their seizure action plan call 911. And that's fine. Not everybody needs a rescue medication, which we'll talk about and touch on in a moment. Also, what I wanted to highlight in this section for how to respond is first aid for any seizure. All of this is important. So staying with the patient and keeping them calm. If you can, try to time the seizure and how long it lasts because that helps us determine how long to give a, when to give a seizure rescue medication. But also that's information that a family member or EMS would wanna know. And then keep the patient safe. Don't restrain them. Move things out uh, from their area if they're, they might hit themselves or get injured. And then turn them on their side. If they're not awake and able to be alert, you want to have them on their side. doesn't matter left or right, but some people during a seizure will throw up or they'll throw up after a seizure or they may have excessive, excessive drooling. And you're trying to get that out of their mouth instead of going back down into their lungs and then stay with them until they are recovered. The third section is what we talked about, what counts as a seizure emergency, different for you than it is for me. This is what that section looks like. Here's an example of how you might fill it out. A lot of people with epilepsy don't just have one type of seizure, they have multiple types of seizures. So the first seizure being um, in this example, for example, if I had a generalized tonic-clonic seizure lasting longer than three minutes, I would give midazolam nasal spray, which is five milligrams, which is one spray. But if I had a cluster of absence seizures, so staring seizures, uh, and I had more than three within five minutes, then I would wanna give an oral dissolvable tablet of clonazepam and maybe one milligram tablet. And how to give it, you place it between the gum and the cheek. So you can have more than one seizure rescue medication for different occasions. There's a second page to this, which goes into instructions, for example, what to tell the emergency room or the first responder, uh, special instructions on uh, what things to expect with the seizure rescue medications, and of course, their healthcare contacts. So the last slide or two is just to say, does everybody need a seizure action plan? Well, in the state of Connecticut, a lot of schools and institutions do need one, and they like to have, not only for safety, but they like to have that to have clarity on what to expect for this person and know when to intervene. When you are an adult with epilepsy, it's a little bit different. Should you have a seizure action plan? Well, ultimately, it's up to you to to disclose that to your work or friends at college. And it's something that you should think about whether you're comfortable about, but it again provides clarity for your safety, what things to expect, and also who to tell in case you do have a seizure rescue medication on you, but you don't, you wouldn't be able to give it to yourself during an emergency. So at a minimum, I would encourage everybody to talk about it. You know, um, when you're an adult, it's slightly different than when you're a child, but it is something to think about. How do you keep yourself safe? 
And lastly, does everyone need a seizure rescue medication? Well, the default, of course, is yes. Why wouldn't you? You want to empower people um, to have the ability to stop a prolonged seizure in somebody who is at risk for that. But there's actually other things that we consider too. Overall, the risk of status epilepticus is low. What if you're a parent and you are out and about with your child and you left your seizure rescue medication at home and then they had a seizure out in the world and just the guilt of not having it during that time um, probably weighs very heavily on you. It may also restrict people's activity to participate in certain things um, or restrict their ability, I apologize, to participate in certain activities. For example, a seizure rescue medication needs a trained person to administer it in school settings. So is a student not allowed to go on a field trip because there's no nurse available to be there with the seizure rescue medication. So there is a possibility of, of when you're prescribing or adding these medications that it could restrict them. Um, and then lastly, of course, the cost. So some of these seizure rescue medications are newer and brand name only. They ultimately, the nasal sprays have become a lot easier for people to administer and are good in a lot of other ways, but cost is unfortunately not one of them. So thank you everyone for your attention. Now I'm gonna open it up to questions now. I know uh, some of these topics are probably not uh, unfamiliar to many of you, but I did hope that you took something away from this. All right, Monica, would you wanna read me the um, chat questions? Yes. Um, so the first one is, is there a difference between seizure clusters or acute repetitive seizures and prolonged seizures? You um, may consider both of them status epilepticus. Uh, for example, status ep epilepticus would be one prolonged seizure, but if you had shorter seizures that were back to back and you did not wake up in between, that would also be considered status epilepticus. So that would both be considered a time when it's a seizure emergency Acute repetitive seizures, um, also called seizure clusters, is something where, where people define having self-resolved seizures, but three or more in a day. Um, and that was really a definition that was put out there when people started doing medication trials for rescue medications. That being said, um, the, a cluster is, is not really a formal definition, and I would say a cluster really depends on the patient. So Epson seizures, um, for example, where you have staring off seizures, but they're brief, five or 10 seconds, you can have dozens of those a day, and I wouldn't call that seizure clusters. It's just the nature of that type of epilepsy. Um, so it varies a little bit. So they can be the same thing. They can both be considered status epilepticus, particularly if those short seizures happen back to back. Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, I think that can be confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and definitely in the school systems too, I think we get those questions a lot during, during the training. You know, how do you know that sort of thing, the difference there? Um, so is there um, a better option for somebody that has, um, I guess, blood pressure issues if they're uh, being prescribed the nasolam and that's something where their blood pr pressure drops dangerously low and they end up in the hospital. Um, this is a mom that's asking or yeah. father. So all of the seizure rescue medicines are in that class of benzodiazepines. So they all have that potential for uh, low blood pressure. The low blood pressure can often happen when you are giving the medication at a big dose right away. Um, and depending on what type of seizure you have, you probably do want to stop it right away. So for example, if you had a um, one prolonged seizure, the way to stop it is giving a big dose of the medicine right away. Now, these are dosed on weight for children, and so, uh, or any seizure rescue medicine for children is based on their weight. And so, there are some things that I would think about. So, I would um, 
I would decrease the dose potentially to say, okay, could the seizure be stopped with a lower dose of medication? Um, I would, as a physician, I would ensure to say that knowing that this child has had blood pressure issue, you should definitely be calling 911 every time. So there are some patients who get seizure rescue medicines with some rare regularity, for example, once a month, and we know that it stops the seizure and we know they don't have breathing or blood pressure issues afterwards, they don't have to go to the hospital. Sometimes they just call us. Um, but in this case, when there is a history of blood pressure or breathing issues, going to the hospital would be important to be to monitor for that. And then the other thing that I would consider is, well, do they really need a, a big dose all at once? Or are we trying to prevent more seizures later that day, if that's why we're giving a rescue medicine, and then doing something that is a little bit slower onset, but maybe longer acting like a dissolvable pill, um, or an extra dose of, of a liquid medication, those are other options too. And, and in discussing like the affordability of these medicines, mm -hmm. I know you mentioned, and I didn't know this, that mm -hmm. compounded emergency rescue medications are generally less expensive. So I'm guessing it just depends on what type of insurance a family has and then kind of taking it from there. Yeah, unfortunately, it depends on the insurance a little bit. Um, and in the state of Connecticut, our state Medicaid Husky is pretty generous in covering the medications. And so rescue medications, including the nasal sprays that are commercially available, can be covered. We can even ask, for example, Valtoco, which is um, FDA approved six and up. If we had a, a larger, smaller child, say like a five-year-old, we can ask that it, we can try to prescribe it and ask for it to be approved off-label. So there are th certain things that we can do and often appealing it. Um, both of those medications are brand name only right now, the, the um, commercially available ones, and they both have patient um, payment assistance, like a copay assistance that reduces the cost significantly. As I mentioned, there's a few more years of the patent. So 2027, 2026 and 2027, I believe are when the patents expire. So it should come down in cost with that. However, even rectal diazepam, which is the generic of the brand name diastat, the generic is not that cheap. Um, and so it is, it is something to really speak about with your physician and something that I talk about with families and why I don't always think every family needs a seizure rescue medication is because mm -hmm. the likelihood of needing it is quite low. And if they've never had a seizure, that makes me worried about uh, their safety, for example, then it's really more of a discussion to say, hey, we have these available. Here are the pros and cons about them. And you tell me if, you, if I prescribe this and you go to the pharmacy and it's $200 with your insurance, please don't buy it. Please let me know and we'll talk about alternatives. Mm -hmm. And for some families, $200 is affordable and reasonable, and they don't call and let me know. But for some other families, I say, you know what, if it's not affordable, please let me know. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know like most medications, uh, people receive a 30-day supply, or even mm -hmm. I guess can, can receive a 60-day or 90-day supply. But with these emergency medications, mm -hmm. is there a limit to what they can get and how frequently they can get that prescription? That's a great question. Um, the shelf life is also different in different versions of medication. So that is something too that plays into the affordability. So um, you you can prescribe a um, bunch of them at once. It really depends on your insurance. So um, if you are a, a child who or an adult who has seizures frequently and need multiple rescue medications per week, that can be covered by your insurance. Other insurances will sometimes have limits per month, so quantity limits, and they say, well, you can have four devices per month. Um, whether that's enough for you or not is remains to be seen. Now, one thing that your question brought up that I didn't talk about during this talk is there is actually a shelf life for these, and that is something that plays into the affordability issue. So the shelf life initially, um, 
for nasolam was only a year, and then they did additional testing that extended it to two years. Valtoco is additional in two years. Now that's two years from when it was manufactured. When you go to the pharmacy and pick up the medication that I prescribe or that your doctor prescribes, you may be given one that has already been sitting on the shelf six months. And it, there's a little bit of difficulty controlling, like trying to get the newest one, because this is a medication that pharmacies often have to order in. They don't always have it sitting around. And I think what, one last question. So is one, d does one, uh, is one more fast acting than another? Or is that difficult to answer? Um, they are relatively, do you mean for the nasal sprays? Well, I guess just like all the forms that you were, you talked yeah. about tonight, yeah. is there one that is, you know, more? Because I know, like, when you look at the prescription and information <laughs> about the particular drug, they'll say up to 15 minutes, but you know it works quicker than that. And yes. so I was just curious, like, how fast really does it work? The rapidity of um, the action really depends on what route you're giving it. So the reason why we give daisypam rectally is because you have a lot of small capillaries right around the rectum that absorb that medication pretty quickly. Same in the nose. So when you do this nasal spray, the reason why it has such a long tip here is because it's trying to go all the way in the back of your nose. And when you do the nasal spray, it's trying to hit those capillaries areas way up there and have that medication in these tiny, tiny little drops be absorbed into your, um, into your bloodstream. So the, the rapidity has to do with how quickly it gets into your bloodstream. Something like taking a medication by mouth um, is the slowest, but the oral dissolvable tablets, the ones that you can, or the, the, or the liquid medication that you put between the gum and the cheek, those dissolve um, and get into your body relatively quickly, but slower than something like the rectal gel or the nasal spray. Um, part of that question for how quickly it acts also has to do with how well was that medication given. So diastat not only do a lot of families not want to give a rectal administration of a medication, but it can be a little bit tricky if you've never given it before. So there's a few different steps like make sure you take the top off and putting on lubricant and getting your uh, your family member or your child in the appropriate position. And then you have to very slowly depress the plunger over a few seconds. And then when you take it out, hold the butt cheeks closed for a few seconds so that the medication doesn't come right back out. And all of those things take a, are important for that medication to be absorbed appropriately. In, um, in comparison, the nasal sprays, whether it's this or a compounded one, are very easy. And so there's a higher chance that you're giving it appropriately. Overall, I would say the nasal spray and the rectal gel, uh, the rectal diazepam are the most effective ways um, to stop a seizure quickly. Sometimes people need more than one dose of a seizure rescue medication. Hmm. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you, Monica, again, for the invitation. It was lovely to chat with you. Yes, th thank you, Dr. Warden. And for everyone um, joining us tonight, just to let you know, this will be, a recording will be available on our website. So mm -hmm. if you'd like to share with um, others that weren't able to be here tonight in your family or friends, uh, please feel free to send them to our website, which is epilepsyct.com. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.